I'd uh, now like to uh, to welcome uh, Darren Cole. Um, Darren ran a session for Carers UK staff uh, a couple of months ago that um, was uh, went down really well. Was really helped. Staff found it really helpful, and uh, and um, a few staff said, "Oh, Darren would be great at a share and learn session." And uh, so we're delighted. He's fitted us in. He's got a very busy November with, as you'd imagine, with lots of people wanting to hear from him. So, uh, Darren, welcome. Really great that you could join us this morning. Thank and you uh, so over much. to you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you for that warm introduction there, Michael. Thank you and morning, everybody. Um, as I said before, as Michael mentioned before, we are going to be talking about loads of hints and tips here, things that we think would be really helpful, but there will be a, a, a section at the end for you to be able to share things that you're doing that's working really well for you, because ultimately we're all going through this at exactly the same time. We're all dealing with it in our own unique ways. So if you have got something that's working really well, please don't be afraid to share it when we get to that element of, of the session. So my aim today is to ultimately discuss cost of living crisis. Of course, it's all over the news. You're probably sick of hearing it, but it is something that we need to talk about because there's a lot going on. And if you just watch the news, that can probably leave you in a bit of a state because they just focus on the headlines and they want to just get your attention. And sometimes they don't explain the real impact of what's really happening. So what I'm going to be doing is walking us through this, what the cost of living is, what it means for us and our money, but most importantly, what can we do to try and minimize the impact of all these rises in costs? And that's what I really want to get across to you today. So let's talk about that in a bit more detail. So as I said before, understanding what's actually causing it, what it means for us is the most important thing, because then we're able to take action. If we don't understand what's going on and the impact of it, we're just sort of left in a bit of a panic and that can cause more problems than it's actually worth. So the aim is to talk through that first. Then we're going to talk about practical tips and saving money on things like your debt, your household bills. And we'll touch on the electricity side of things and the gas side of things, the energy, but I'll hand over to Liz on that side of things when it comes to what's available and how we can get some help there. But we're going to talk about some practical tips. And then finally, this is probably one of the most important bits, is what we can do going forward. We didn't plan this. This has happened to us. We've come out of a two year pandemic straight into a cost of living crisis. So we haven't really touched the ground as, as such. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about what we can do going forward to build up some resilience. So we're prepared for the worst that could potentially happen. That way, nothing's really a shock to us. OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is the cost of living crisis, even just to call it that it does make it a bit more of a bigger thing. But what I would like to say about that is, that the cost of living crisis isn't anything new. People were actually struggling years before this. Things have been coming more expensive anyway. It's just now they're more accelerated. So they're becoming more expensive and they're doing it at such a fast rate. In actual fact, last year, there was around 2.17 million people already using food banks. That's probably quadrupled now this year. Actually, a lot of food banks are struggling. They've actually said that they've run out of money, they've run out of donations, and they are really requesting people to try and help. So that just gives you a bit of a picture of what's really going on on ground level. But this really didn't really start hitting the headlines until April this year. Now, the reason for that is energy prices jumped up dramatically in April. It was around an 80% jump in, in, in cost there, and it jumped again this October. We do have the energy price cap that's in place. It was originally for two years. It's now only to April. We will talk about that, but that's helped to sort of minimize the increase in regards to costs. But that's only gonna be for this particular winter. So we have to bear in mind once April comes along, we don't know what the scenario will be at that point, And we will have to sort of, sort of wait and see. The biggest issue for me, what we don't talk about enough is, as I mentioned, we had a pandemic and the pandemic sort of is a sort of something we don't really talk about anymore. It was all of it in the past in a sense. But what that did, that wiped out a lot of household savings. So a lot of people had savings in place. They had to use it because they were made, maybe furloughed. Maybe they lost their jobs or off work long term sick. That meant that they had to exhaust their savings. So around 22% of UK adults at the moment have no savings at all or £100 or less, which is, is, is a big concern. What that ultimately means is as the prices are going up, people's money can't stretch far enough. And that's leading a lot of people to rely on debt. Debts are spiraling out of control. That's leading a lot more people to have more struggles. So that's really what's going on and has been going on for quite some time. But now it's sort of in the, in the news. It's become a hot topic. It's on the news every single day. So now we are sort of tuning into our money more now than ever before. 
So let's talk about what's actually causing the crisis, because if we understand what's causing it, we can then start to think about what we need to be doing. So first and foremost, the first thing, energy prices. On average, this year, around 80% increase in costs. That is absolutely astronomical. Most people this winter will be paying nearly double what they paid last year. No fault of their own, just the fact that these costs are going up and they are continuing to go up into the new year as well. But it's not just that. One of the other biggest issues that we're talking about, but probably not as much as I would like, is our food costs. Now, you've probably noticed already your weekly shop is getting ever so slightly more expensive week on week. There's no sort of surprise behind this. Food prices have gone up this year by 14.8%. This is pegged to continue going into sort of the end of next year. Certain foods will become hard to find. Others will become extremely expensive. I don't know if you've seen on the news about the average price of a pack of Lur pack butter is now around seven pound a normal 250 gram tub of butter. It's just obscene. So it is getting out of control. And there is some things I'm going to sort of show you that we can do to try and minimize this impact. But that is a huge one, our food costs. Not to mention our traveling costs, not just our petrol and diesel and our cars, but TFL have recently put their fare prices up as well. So just going to work and getting around is going to cost you more. So again, we've got everything else going up around us pretty hard to avoid this that stuff is sort of hitting the headlines and they would have you think that it's just gas and electricity it's just the energy prices that's causing this but there's actually a couple of other things in the background bubbling and silently there's also council tax went up this year by 4.4 percent now they usually that would hit the news but because it's quite insignificant compared to everything else it didn't really hit the news line but it's still an increase it means more money out of our pockets and then to make matters worse, if you have a mortgage, the Bank of England base rate has aggressively been increasing rates this year. Eight times in a row we've had increases. At, at just a year ago, the rates were 0.1%. They're now at 3%. So if you have a fixed rate mortgage that you're coming to an end, for some people, that's up to £500 extra per month on their mortgage costs not to mention their energy costs, food costs, and travel as well. So as you can see, it is really dire times at the moment. Now, the main figure they use on, on the TV is inflation. And I want to talk to you about inflation and why it's a bit, and again, a bit of a pessimist mindset here, it's a bit of a trickery figure. They say that prices have gone up by 10.1%. I can very much beg to differ. Is it 10.1% or is it closer to 30% right now? Probably closer to 30% in reality. Inflation is a record of previous costs. OK, so it says inflation is 10.1 percent, but in reality, it's probably closer to 20 or 30 percent. And we know that because we're feeling that in our weekly costs. The problem with inflation, though, is that it's designed to give you an idea of what's going on in the bigger picture, but it's not exactly accurate. So let me show you the impact this is going to have on our money. And this is quite worrying. Last year. We saw bills go up. Bills go up every year regardless. This is something that we have to get used to. Unfortunately, things never get cheaper. The good news is that typically things go up at such a small rate that you don't really notice it, apart from this year, which has been quite a roller coaster so far. Now, based on a typical household outgoings, and let's look at a household earning, say, £30,000. In 2021, all of those bills were still there, still had to be paid, but there was money left over at the end of every month to potentially save, to have a social life, to do other things. As of the beginning of this year, that dramatically changed when we saw the energy prices jump up. It left a lot more, lot less um, wiggle room when it comes to our finances. We've seen the average household outgoings rise from around 13,700 a year up to around 15,000 pounds a year. That is due to continue rising. Now, as of the end of this year, we predict that the average household outcomes will probably settle down at around 15,700. So 15,700, that's not including that obviously national insurance has gone back down as of this yesterday. So let's clarify this. Bills have gone up on average around 2,000 pounds a year, but salaries are not keeping up. So we now know that our salaries can't keep up with the level of the cost of going on. To make matters worse, interest rates on savings are not keeping up with inflation, which means our buying power is reducing, but everything else is going up in costs, which ultimately means we're all going to be less left worse off than we were last year. Now, depends on your own circumstances, depending on how impacted you're going to be and how um, quickly you'll be impacted. But the one thing I can tell you is all of us are going to feel the pinch regardless. That's leaving more and more households having to make that really difficult choice between eating or heating. 
this is a real thing. I've got clients that have phoned me and have been in absolute tears, have done nothing but their best, and they're left in a really sticky situation purely because of these price rises. If you are in this position, please do not suffer in silence. You have not made mistakes. This is something that's happened to all of us. And we need to try and get into the habit now of sharing things that work well for us, sharing ways of saving money, because ultimately we all need to do that. Now, when I go through things that we can do to save money, because that's what I'm going to be focused on right now, I want to focus on the, part, the parts that we have influence on, the areas that we can change and put a positive outcome to things. One thing to bear in mind, everything that I speak about now is very time sensitive, meaning that it may be available now, but it might go off the shelves tomorrow based on what's going on. So we're going to talk about some really quick and easy money saving tips from your household bills to your debts to your shopping. But then we're at the end, we're going to open up for your opportunities to things that you're doing as well. So please get those ready. So let's get going. Let's go through this at any point. If you want to elaborate on anything, please use that chat box, get the questions in. I'll answer all questions at the end. But let's go. So first and foremost, your unsecured debt. So we have seen the average debt in households increase. Since the pandemic, it's been increasing quite dramatically, but even more so now because of the costs. So the average household credit card debt at the moment is around £2,229 per household average. Now, that is a concern in itself because that is gradually and slowly but surely creeping upwards. To make matters worse, a lot of these credit card companies are taking advantage of this environment and they're putting their interest rates up. Again, more people relying on debt, they wanna make money off the back of that. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the business. But what is quite worrying, these are the highest interest rates that we've seen since 1998. So that means more and more people are getting into debt, but more and more people are paying far more interest on that debt, means it could lead you to spiral out of control. So a couple of quick tips. If you have a credit card and you want to clear it down, there's a couple of things you need to be aware of. First of all, if you're just paying the minimum repayment, okay, absolutely fine that you do that, but just be aware it will take you a considerable amount of time to clear that credit card debt if you're just paying the minimums. Let me show you exactly how worrying this could actually be. So I've put in that figure on here and you can visit this website as well, Money Saving Expert. Great website to compare your household bills and get some really cheap opportunities when it comes to securing some debt as well. Now on there, they have something called a minimum repayment calculator and this will shock you. So I've put in that figure there of £2,229 on a credit card and I've put in the interest rate there being 21.5%. And I'm saying here, I'm just paying the minimum repayments. How long will it take me to clear this credit card? And I'd love to do this in a live environment because I'll get you guys to start getting involved and answer how long you'd think it will take to clear just over £2,000 on a credit card. I'm more or less sure everyone will be wrong. The actual answer to clear just over £2,000 paying them a minimum repayment is 39 years. This is the part that credit card companies don't tell us. They're very happy to give us the credit card. They're very happy to increase the credit limits. But when it comes to repaying it, they very rarely tell us if you just pay the minimum, you're going to be paying for half of your lifetime. That's just a balance of £2,000. Imagine if that was £5,000, £10,000. That can really dishearten a lot of people and put them in a position where it feels like it's impossible to clear that debt. That's why it's extremely important. If you are paying the minimum repayment, where possible, pay just a little bit above that. That little extra will help to clear this down and reduce those years significantly. Something we need to be aware of, credit cards are really, really useful if used well. But if you are finding you are struggling to keep on top of things, please do not bury your head. Speak to the providers, see what help can be put in place. If you are in a position where you're paying interest rate uh, interest on your credit cards, please stop. There are balance transfer cards out there, albeit some of them are disappearing from the market with the rates going up. Some of them are not as favorable. So you need to move quickly if you do want to get a balance transfer card. So the first thing to do is to first find the balance transfer card. You go onto the Money Saving Expert website, find out if it's cheaper than the card you're paying now. If it is brilliant, apply for it, get that done. Do not spend on that card. The whole point of balance transfer cards are to freeze your interest and give you time to pay it off. This is not designed to continue spending. If you continue spending on it, you're no doubt going to get back into the same scenario and the interest rate will start being applied and it just won't lead into a good situation at all. So where possible, don't spend on it. Remember to pay at least the minimum, but the aim here is to pay it off entirely by the time it comes to the end of that 
sort of no interest period. So if it's one year, two years, three years, by the end of that period, you're aiming to completely clear that balance off, meaning you saved a lot of money in interest and you're then debt free. So again, if you have got a credit card debt, please do whatever you can to structure a plan of how you're gonna get rid of it because it is gonna become more expensive and it potentially will start to give you a bit of a drag on your financials. So that's the credit card side of things. Again, very useful if you use it right. Just be aware if you are in a bit of trouble with it, speak to the providers, get some help. The other thing we wanna talk about is personal loans. And we don't talk about this enough, but I wanna share your experience where you can save a lot of money here. So let's say you've got a personal loan and typically you have a personal loan for one up to five years. And the aim is as long as you make your direct debit payments every month, when it comes to the end of the term, the loan is completely finished. So that's the good news of it. It comes to an end. However, there is some money that can be saved. Whilst rates are relatively low, you may be in a position where by switching your loan to another one that's pay, charging a lower interest, you can save some money. Now, typically that's quite hard to work out because you've I've got my loan, I've got three years left on this loan. How do I know it's actually cheaper? What calculations do I need to do? That's the good news about the Money Saving Expert website and it really is useful. They have a calculator there to work out if it's worthwhile you switching your loans across. Again, you look at your current loan, you get a settlement figure, you put that into here, you put the, the figures for the new loan, and it will work out quite straightforward if it's cheaper to switch loans or not. It will say, yes, switch it, and this is the saving, or it will say, no, it's not worth switching. That gives you confidence whether you should make that attempt or not. Not for everybody, but it is an opportunity to save some money. I've done it more recently. I bought a car last year on a higher purchase. I then got a personal loan this year to clear that, which means not only do I own the car at right, technically, um, but it's a lower rate of interest. So I save around £6,000 over the next six years, or next three years, sorry. So quite a large saving to be made. The same could be said with things like mortgages. And again, this is the one we really need to work on. If you have a mortgage and you're not in a fixed rate, please speak to your mortgage broker or mortgage advisor as soon as you can. The rates have just recently gone up to 3% last week, Thursday, and the rates are predicted to keep on going up through the new year and probably up to the end of next year as well. The Bank of England are doing this to battle inflation. The problem is coming this. They're putting rates up, which means those who have a mortgage or any kind of debts is becoming more expensive. The issue is that inflation is not coming down. So inflation is staying up, but now we've got interest rates being up. So that means if you've got a mortgage or even any kind of variable rate debt, you're paying more out for that debt and the costs are still going up anyway. So it means less money in our pockets, more coming out every single month. So that's where we get into a bit stuck at the moment. And this is going to become an increasing problem because the rates are going up and they're continually going up. So if you do have a mortgage, please speak to a mortgage broker, mortgage advisor as soon as you can. Speak about the opportunities out there, what deals are out there, and try your best to save as much money as you can going forward. These interest rates and the deals available are not become, becoming a little bit unfavorable. The rates are, are typically around 5 to 6%, which we haven't seen since 2008. So that is a big worry, but we need to move on this. If you have a mortgage, please do not sit in silence. Speak to a mortgage advisor. See if there's anything they can do to help. So that's the debt side of things. And forgive me for going through that some pace. It's just that I've got a lot to cover and I really want to make sure this session is really useful for you. But debts are important. Try and get them as cheap as possible if we're not able to clear them off entirely. Now, other areas that we can try and have an impact. Now, this may be a smaller saving here, but we need to try and make as much small savings as we can, as that will accumulate to one large saving overall. So when it comes to your energy and utility bills, as I can be completely honest here, and Liz will be able to shed some more light on what packages are available to help you here, but let's talk about it. Energy prices, they have been going up dramatically over the last 12 months. And you see on the graph, if you look at winter last year and look at winter this year, you will see it's nearly double the amount that we had to pay. Very, very concerning because winters typically in the, in the UK are not exactly warm. They are quite cold and we're probably looking in a very, very wet and cold winter ahead. So that means more usage when it comes to electric and gas, ultimately meaning we're gonna pay out more money. Now we had a new price cap being launched that got launched just um, in September and that's designed initially to be in place for two years. That cap was at two and a half thousand pounds. However, some things have been changing, Liz left the office and now that's been scrapped and it will only be in place until April. So what does that mean for us? It means that we're gonna to have to go back to some basics when it comes to our uses when it comes to energy. So first of all, do keep your eyes out for cheaper tariffs. They're not available at the moment, I can be very, very honest, 
but there may be some tariffs that pop up exclusively for a period of time or for existing customers. If it happens, you need to be very, very quickly. But things that we're going to have to consider doing this winter. First of all, turning the temperature down. I've seen a lot of people mention that they've got electric blankets and they've got electric heaters because that works out as slightly cheaper than using the gas heater. So just other ideas there. Um, think about using your appliances off peak. So there is a lot of deals happening at the moment and some people are eligible, some are not, and some light will be shed on this hopefully in the coming weeks, that if you use your appliances, washing machine, dryer, stuff like that, off peak, so maybe at night, it's a bit cheaper than running it during the day. They'll be running this um, quite soon. They should be running this out. A lot of um, EDF customers, I know the first lot to get sort of a message around this. If you use certain appliances off peak, it will save you some money. So it's an opportunity there. Have a smart meter if you can afford to get one and um, invest in one of those. I did that. It's sort of a double-edged sword. Good news, I can see the energy being used. Bad news, I'm a bit addicted to it now. So I'm constantly looking at it and watching it and turning things off and just to try and save money where we can. So quite useful to see usage, but can be quite addictive to look at it. So just bear that in mind. And then finally, think about the government support that is available. And I'm going to briefly touch on this. And then Liz will be, be talking about what other packages are available in more detail. So first and foremost, when Liz came in, and again, forgive me, she was in very short space of time, a bit of musical chairs being played with the government at the moment. So she came in, she announced there would be some support. Initially, it was a two-year price cap on the energy costs at two and a half thousand pounds. It was designed to be there for two calendar years. However, that's been scrapped now by the new chancellor and said it's only going to be available to April next year, after which point they're aiming to target their help. What that means, we just don't know, but that's going to cause a little bit of concern. We thought we had two years of a bit of a breathing space. Turns out we've got about five months. So not ideal, but we still got something to get us through this winter. That is on top of the £400 that we've got as an energy grant. We should have all started to receive that. You should have received your first £66 payment either on your bill or directly into your bank account. If you haven't received that for any reason, please do check with your energy provider. That first payment should have been paid and you should get around £66 a month up until March and then it comes to an end. That's a nice to have, it does help. It doesn't cover everything, of course it doesn't, but it does help, it does sort of you know, give us a bit of a boost there. There is some additional support available depending on your circumstances. So for those that are already retired, they can have an additional 300 pounds payment. It's also for those that are using old LPG or old burners, they will have a discretionary payment made as well. And towards businesses and charities, there are meant to be some help being rolled out, but once again, we haven't had clarity on that as yet. So. There is some help out there. Please do try and exhaust all the help that you can get. It does mean seeing if there's any help you can get even from the provider themselves or directly from the government support. Do look around, try and exhaust that. Honestly, this is a time where every single one of us needs to be looking at any discounts, any helps that we can get. And again, um, Liz will be able to help us more with that in a moment. Other areas that we can make some savings is more towards our luxuries. Now, I say our luxuries, but they're becoming our necessities. So things like our internet, subscription service, streaming services. These are the things that we could potentially start to tailor a little bit to maybe save some money. Now, don't get me wrong. You're not going to save waves of money. You're not going to save hundreds of pounds here, but the little savings that you make will accumulate to larger ones. So first and foremost, have you recently haggled with your providers? your mobile phone provider, your internet provider, TV subscription, they are expecting you to do this. So please make sure you call up your Sky, Virgin, call up your mobile phone provider, your internet providers and say to them, look, you know as well as I do, this is the cost of living crisis. What help can you give me, please? You'll be very surprised. A lot of them are offering particular tariffs or exclusive discounts because they want to keep your business and they'd rather give you a discount to keep you than you cancel the service altogether. So do try and see if you can haggle with them. Don't feel any way about this. On average, you can save just over £100 a year if you haggle. And I think more of us need to do that. Sometimes we feel a bit bad for haggling. Why should we? Get on that phone, nag them, see if you can save any money. We really do need to try and make savings where we can. Now, the other areas that we can make a quite a large saving um, over time, at least, is things like our streaming services, our Netflix, our um, Amazon, things like that. If you don't use it, 
cancel it. If you do use it, maybe try and see if there's a family package available, any online discounts, trial basis you can take advantage of, anything that's going to help you to reduce your monthly outgoings, but of course still have some luxuries and things that make you feel happy because we work hard. But what we want to do is not pay out things that we're not utilizing. So that includes gym memberships. Um, sometimes we have a gym membership, haven't used it, cancel it for now, restart it when you know you're going to use it and commit to it. That money could be redirected towards our bills. Any little saving, we can redirect it to one of our bills to help us get through this quite a tough time. Another one to think about is insurances. Now, things like car and home insurance. Again, this is a very quick tip here, is if you get a renewal, there's something they don't tell you you must try and renew as soon as possible. At least 20 days left on your policy is the best time to renew. And let me explain why. And I used to work in insurance for a while. Now, what happens is when you renew quite quickly, um, you, you get the best possible discounts, mainly because they want to get your business as soon as possible. And they want you to renew with them or they want you to sort of you know, sign up. Now, what you'll find is if you renew with like a day or two left, you won't get any discounts. In fact, the prices will probably go up because at that particular point, they want to charge you full whack and they just expect you to pay it because they know you need insurance. So if you do get a, an opportunity to renew your policies, do it straight away, search the market, find the cheapest one and sign up to it. It will give you the best possible discount. If you leave it too late, discounts start to disappear and the cost tends to go up. Something worth thinking about, it will save a small amount of money, but it's still a saving. Please, guys, let's try and renew our insurances as soon as we can. Now we're going into the area where we're probably going to be quite impacted, and this is where we have to start thinking about our shopping. And I've got some really exciting apps and websites that we can use to help us with this. Now, we need to shop a little bit smarter because shopping is becoming increasingly expensive. On average, we're seeing around 30 to 50 pounds being added to our weekly shops. That's going to continue and things are going to become more expensive as we go through the winter. So let's try and think about ways that we can save some money. Now, forgive me if you're already doing some of these, but I think it makes sense sometimes to put all of them down and we just try and do everything we can to make some savings. So first thing, if you shop online, do not be afraid to search around for discount vouchers. There are loads of those available online. And by just taking a moment to look, you could save five, 10, sometimes even more percentage of, of your costs. Think about planning your shops. Some people will do this. I never used to. I used to just walk into the shopping center and just buy whatever came to my mind overspent all the time so now I plan my weekly shops again writing down what I need um, I buy what I need when I need it I'd rather than just buying because I see a deal that's really important um, think about things like cashback things as well using cashback schemes are really important they may only save you a couple of pence or pounds at each transaction but it's still a saving um, online shopping if you're an online shopper take your time and look around because a lot of times sometimes the prices are inflated just because you're online so do look around do a bit of Google's Find out if you can find the same item cheaper elsewhere. Take the time out. Honestly, most of the time you can get a little savings there. Buy supermarket brands where possible. And then finally, bulk buy if you can, Use, utilizing things like the Costco's and stuff like that. That's the sort of obvious things that some of us are already doing, I'm sure. But let's talk about the, the actual apps out there that can help us. And this is going to be really useful. So the first app is called Priceable please take the time to download this app. It's absolutely free. And what this is, it's a comparison site for our shopping. So if you're wondering whether you to go to Lidl, Tesco, Morrison's, you're not too sure which one's the cheapest, all that can be made really, really easy and simple. Just download the Priceable app. You put in your normal shop, what you would get, and it will compare the prices in Asda, Sainsbury's, all of the high street supermarkets, including promotions that they have right now. So if one particular store, store's got what, buy one, get one free, it will show you that. So again, you can go to the store, make a huge saving here. Honestly, this app is so valuable and it will save you a lot of money. So try it out, see how you get on with it. But it is free, so give it a go. We mentioned about cashback. For years, I ignored cashback accounts. There's, this is just to name a few. So Top Cashback and Quidco, I ignored this. And the reason being, because every time I saw cashback, it was like 2% on your cashback or 5% cashback. It didn't seem like a lot of money. I can tell you now, I regret not signing up to this many, many years earlier, because ultimately it really does save you some money and you're spending the same money you were gonna spend anyway. It's just that now you get some cashback. Please, please try it out. It's really easy to do. You can download the app or visit the website, sign up to a cashback account. And what you do is if you want to go shopping, you go onto the cashback account, you search for that particular retailer. If they've got any deals going, you click that retailer's link. It takes you to the website. 
you buy everything that you're going to buy as normal. And then within a couple of weeks, sometimes a month or so, you then get your cash back. Once it goes into the cash back account, you can take it out and put it into your bank account. You can spend it. You can enjoy it. This is money that otherwise just would never have been seen. So try it out. Cashback accounts are brilliant. And I would encourage anyone, if you have the time, to sign up to one and get yourself started. This next app is really, really important. At the beginning, we talked about food banks and we mentioned how food banks are running out of money and they are struggling to get donations. And that's quite difficult because it means many households who do need the help are not getting it because food banks are closing down or they're saying they have to limit what they're giving. Olio helps to plug that gap. So Olio is an app where you're able to put on their food that otherwise would have been thrown out. So maybe if you look around in your cupboards and your fridges, if there's food in there that you're not going to consume, it's still in date, you can put it on this particular app. And it allows people in your local community to come around and collect this food. Now, the good news is it's not just the local community that can put, money, put food on here. Even Tesco, pret a um, Costa, just to name a few, large organizations have signed up to this and they will be putting their food on there as well. So it's a great opportunity to, to share, to make sure that everyone in the community can eat and look after their families. And it, maybe you may need this in the future, who knows? But if you have any food that you would like to gift, um, you can put it on this app for free and it allows people in your local community to come and collect that. So again, great opportunity for us to share amongst ourselves and to help. So try it out see if it's worthwhile for you and see if it works. Next one, next two sites <clears throat> are websites, not necessarily apps, but this app here or website, sorry, is approvedfood.co.uk, a fantastic website where you can get reduced food. So if you go shopping, you're probably familiar with the reduced aisle, like, you know, a section at the end of the aisle where they put in yellow stickers on the items. It's usually quite crowded because everyone's trying to get a deal. And um, it's basically that, but online. So rather than having to fight your way through to the front to get the deals, you go online, any products on here, they're all within date. They may have damaged products or they may be running out quite imminently, but it's an, you're able to buy these products at a massive discount. So maybe this could reduce your weekly shop because there will be items on there that you buy on a regular basis, but they come at a discount. So again, give you an opportunity to save some money, but still get the same shopping in that you're used to. Try it out. Again, something could be useful. I've used it once or twice before. Um, not always got the greatest deals on there, but actually I've actually used it a few times and may save some money. So give it a go yourself. The last website is more for those that are really keen and reducing our food waste. Now, in the UK, we have a huge food waste problem. We buy a lot of food and we throw out even more food, which is quite worrying, especially now when things are becoming more expensive. And we know there's many households that could do with that food. So the best way to reduce our food waste is to actually make use of the food that we have in our homes. And that's not always easy. Sometimes we have food left over and we're like, we don't know what to do with it. It doesn't really fit into any recipes that we can think of. So we end up throwing it out. This website is really being heavily promoted by Jamie Oliver. It's all over the Tesco website as well. They are pushing this because they really want to reduce food waste. Now, the way this works is you go up on, go on this website, you go into the click search button at the bottom and you would put in what foods you have laying around the home. So potatoes, bread, milk, whatever it may be. And it will try and come up with a recipe that utilizes that particular food. That way you are less likely to throw it away and you're more inclined to create unique recipes. Now, what I will say is that it's it's not the greatest recipe sometimes, so take it with a pinch of salt. I've put I've done a bit of an experiment here and put in bread, for example, and it came up with a bread pudding. But if you don't have all the rest of the ingredients, it just defeats the object. But you can see the process and what they're trying to do here and make sure you don't throw that food out. So well worth utilizing. Try and see if it works for you. Again, it's free. If it doesn't work for you, no problem at all. Nothing lost, but do give it a go. So that brings me to what I call the part where we start to think about what can we do going forward to build up our resilience. We do not have control of the price rises. We can't influence what the government does, unfortunately. We can't make choices in regards to making sure that the prices stop going up. We just have to adapt. So let's talk about things that we could be doing now to make sure that we can build up that resilience, that strength going forward, because things inevitably are gonna get a little bit worse before they get better. So here's a couple of practical tips here. First things first, sleep on your trolley. I mean, don't literally sleep on your trolley, please. It's not that comfortable, I'm sure. Um, but what I mean by that is if you're an online shopper, take time to, before you check out, just take a moment to think, do I need all of these items? Could I find them elsewhere cheaper? And actually, if I don't need them, let's take it out of the basket. And if I can get it cheaper, let's do that. Let's save some money here and try and avoid impulse buying. 
And when I say impulse buying, there's many a website, I'm not going to mention any names, that you could just click one button and you can check out and it, the food or the item will be delivered directly to you. I'm guilty of this. I've used this particular website many a time when I'm shopping and I just click one button and it's buy now and before you know it, it's being delivered to my home. Try and avoid that because that is an impulse buy and a lot of times we do it because we see it there, it's easy done, but we might not need the item. Be aware that if you probably notice this, that when you get to checking out, especially if you are an online shopper, you will start to notice that they're offering you the option of having credit. And what that means is they will allow you to pay for the item now, but you don't pay for it in, out of your pocket until maybe three months later, maybe a bit longer. So you're getting a credit agreement. It's quite a new thing that we're seeing, and it only tends to show up at checkout, so it's a bit sneaky there, but just be aware of what you're clicking, because you may look at this as a good opportunity, but what this might end up doing is creating a whole new problem down the line, a new debt, new income, new interest getting paid, so that could be an issue as well, so just bear that in mind. Currently, we're having a massive influx of, of fraud online, so if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Avoid giving any information to anyone that phones you, to send you a text message or even contact you via email. Fraud has gone up by over a thousand percent since the beginning of COVID-19. A thousand percent increase in fraud. So just be very careful. Do not ever give out your information online. Do not ever give out anything to anyone online or over the phone unless you've made that phone call to that particular organization. Please be extra, extra vigilant. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about now before we open up to questions and also your suggestions of what you're doing with your finances that can help is let's talk about budget planners. For us to get in control of our finances, right now we all need to have a budget planner. Budget planners are the single most important way for us to get control of our finances. Without us doing a budget, we don't know where we're coming or going and if we have enough to cover all of these particular outgoings. Now, a budget planner can be quite boring. It's not an exciting exercise to do, granted, but it's extremely important. And I'm going to give you a recommendation in regards to how you budget. Now, you can use pen and paper, Excel spreadsheets. There's loads of apps out there as well. But I would recommend using this particular budget planner. It's called the Money Helper. And you'll find this on the moneyhelper.org.uk website. That website is fantastic. And as it, as it says in the name, it's designed to help us understand our options with money, especially now with the cost of living crisis. It has loads of helpful tips on there. But the one thing they do have on there, which I really want to promote, is the budget planner. Now, the reason I think this is a really good budget planner, because one, it's colorful, it's engaging and it's simple. But more importantly, you're able to save it, which means you can use it going forward. You fill it out, be completely honest with yourself. Budgets only really work if we're honest about our spending. So put everything that we spend into a budget planner and then it will tell us if we have money left over the end of the month or if we don't. If we find that we're overspending and we're in our overdrafts or we're utilizing credit cards too much, at least we now can see that and we can start to rectify it. Without doing a budget, we are honestly just guessing and that's not the greatest thing to do, especially now. So please, whichever way you see fit, get yourself a budget, giving you that control and then you can take your first step. Finally, if you are in a position to start saving, again, I only say this if you are in this position, if you have any leftover cash at the end of every month, please start to save. We need an emergency fund. The one thing that COVID has taught us is that we need to have money there just in case of the worst. So put in a savings account. It must be instant access savings. Don't worry too much about the rate right now. It's not so much about the rate. It's about having that money instant access. Now, and emergency funds, they do what they say on the tin. So ultimately, if a car breaks down, boiler breaks down, etc. But the biggest reason to have an emergency fund now in this current time is to make sure you don't have to or you're not forced to rely on high interest debt. So things like credit cards, payday loans, overdrafts. By you having cash in your pocket, you can turn to yourself. You can access that money simply at any time you wish to with no interest being attached, with no applications to complete. So where possible, save what you can, when you can. Even if it's £10 a month, £100 a month, whatever you can afford, just save it. Because that will help us to weather the storm that we're potentially going to go through this particular winter. So I'd now like to welcome Liz. Great to see you again, uh, Liz. As, as I mentioned at the beginning, Liz has done so many sessions for us over the last couple of years on uh, tips and guidance on... Uh, lots of um, 
issues related to carers uh, benefits and carers rights and uh, so over to you Liz. Hello hi thank you well thank you Darren that was great and actually we do have a little bit of overlap but that's good because I'm going to go in just a little bit more detail on some of the points that you've raised and it was a really good session you're right Jane. Okay so for those of you who haven't met me before uh, my name's Liz, I'm one of the email advisors. I generally specialise in welfare benefits, uh, general benefit inquiries, and also help with any sort of financials, grants, etc. So as Darren did before me, if you can just pop any questions into the chat box or just raise your hand when I get to the end, that would be great. If I can't answer them today, I will endeavour to get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, so cost of living support packages. As was alluded to, uh, the government made some announcements right at the beginning of the year um, about support that they were going to bring in to help people who were beginning to struggle financially, especially as we got to the, the autumn and the winter. Now, some of these have started to come into play, but I think it's just worth mentioning them all. Um, and as always, you will get a copy of these slides. I've put some interactive links in there so you can click to find out further details about all of the things that I'm going to mention. Some of them I'll just briefly go over. So as, as we've already discovered today, there's the £400 for most households in the UK with help of their electricity costs. This money is credited directly either to your energy account or to your bank account. So everyone who has a domestic energy customer, OK, so if you are a customer who pays someone else for your electrics, so maybe you pay your landlord for your electric, then you might be an excluded group, but you should seek further advice about whether you know you're able to access this. Now, the, uh, there are also different schemes depending on how you pay. So if you've got prepayment meters, so if you're an old style prepayment customer, for example, you don't have a smart meter, you'll receive a text or an email or even a voucher through the post. And they're the ones that you'll need to look out for. And you need to get them to your normal top up supplier to top up your electricity that way. Now, a key thing here is that if you are missing any of these payments, I'll tell you at the end how to contact the relevant departments. But with your energy payments, if you haven't received October's payment and you're a prepayment meter person, you need to get in touch with your energy provider. Any codes that have been issued are only valid for 90 days. And a lot of the energy companies are not back issuing codes. So if you haven't received anything by mid-November, then potentially, um, we need to start to get chasing this up because when we get to the, to March, for example, um, they're not going to be issuing ongoing codes. So please do just double check. And if you have got a voucher, get it used now, get it put on your meter. Um, the money you save by this going on to your electric, if you have gas, you'll be able to use that money to put towards your gas. That's the thought behind it. More people have electricity accounts than they do have main gas. And there is extra help available. It's a £100 payment. If you are off grid, so if, if you have something like um, LPG or if you use oil, for example, so they're paid directly from a different source. And again, further information is available there. I'm still going on about this and I'm so sorry, everyone. Your £150 council tax rebate. It was brought in round about the beginning of the new financial year. If you're in council tax band A to D, you should have already received it directly to your bank account or via a voucher scheme. Or if you're in receipt of council tax support, um, you may have um, had it credited from your bill and you may have had a letter um, from your local authority asking you to provide details of your bank account. So you can be paid this money directly. It depends on your local authority how they are issuing these payments. Now, having said that, there was also something called the discretionary fund. Now, the discretionary fund was a fund where you could make an application if you didn't fall into the automatic criteria, but you were still struggling. Now, a lot of local authorities have money left in this discretionary fund that they can't do anything else with other than pay it to people um, as part of this council tax rebate scheme. So if your discretionary fund is still open, please do, if you are not automatically eligible, make an application. But what some local authorities are doing is that if they have already issued money, um, to people who met this criteria because they can't give it back, because they can't use it for anything else. They are in some local authority areas writing to you 
inviting you to make an application for a small share of what they've got left. So it could be anything from £25 up to around about £150, but this is unique to your local authority. So please do make sure that you're accessing this. Again, a common theme here is make sure that you are not missing out on anything. It's better to apply and find out that you're not eligible than to not have applied and then find out that you were eligible. We get a lot of inquiries in the inbox saying, oh, I didn't realise I was eligible. The closing date is now closed. What can I do? Generally, pretty much if the closing date has closed, it is unlikely um, that you're going to be able to, to make a late application. So think about your council tax. Now, the cost of living payments. This is a really hot topic at the moment. Um, the cost of living payments were a payment of £650, which were announced um, earlier on in the year. It's paid directly to your bank account and it's in two payments. So the first payments were made in July and they were £326, I think it was. And in order to be eligible for that, you had to be in receipt of a qualifying benefit right back in May. Now, so that time has passed. Now, the second payment, the second payment of 324 is just starting to come in. And so from the 8th, which is tomorrow to the 23rd of November, the second payment of £324 is now starting to be paid. Now, the benefits, let me just show you this. So the benefits um, that you're eligible. So if you're in receipt of universal credit, income based job seekers allowance, income based employment and support allowance, and you were receiving payments of those benefits on the 25th of September, um, then you will be in line to receive your payment of £324. If you are receiving income support, pension credit or tax credits, then you are in line to receive that payment. Um, it's paid a little bit later for tax credits, so it will be further towards the end of the month. But for all the other benefits, it's starting to be paid now. Now, what's really interesting about this with pension credit, if you are a household where there is someone of state pension age and you are not claiming pension credit or you've not looked to see if you're eligible, please do. Pension credit is the only benefit on there that you can backdate for three months. So you've got up until the 19th of December to make a pension credit claim, get it backdated. It can even be for one pence you know, and you will receive that £324. OK, so that's something really important just to think about. Make sure you're not missing out. Um, again, it seems to be what I'm always saying. Have a welfare benefits check. Check, check, check. A lot of these benefits are backdatable. And so you can, you know, receive a payment coming up into the future. Brings us back to this slide again. Um, the £300 for pensioners. So this is part of the government's winter fuel payments. So for those of you who have someone who is of pension age in your household, maybe yourself or of pension age, you would be eligible for normally something called your winter fuel payment. Every year there is an eligibility criteria week. So this year it was if you were of state pension age before the 25th of September 1956. Um, sorry, if you were born on or before the 25th of September 1956, you were of state pension age for the qualifying week. And so instead, as well as your normal winter fuel payments, so depending on your circumstances, that could be £100, it could be £200, you will automatically receive on top of that £300. So an extra £300. This is usually paid in November or December. Uh, this money's not taxable and it doesn't stop you from getting other any other types of benefits. It doesn't affect any pensions that you get. Um, and I think that's just worth mentioning that with all of these payments, they're not taken into account as income for any of the benefits that you're on. They are designed there purely to help and support you. OK, so the last one. So if you have anyone in your household, so the person maybe you're caring for or possibly you yourself, and they are in receipt of a disability benefit. So we pretty much all know, but for those of us who um, are maybe unfamiliar, Disability benefits are benefits who are paid to two people with long term health conditions or disabilities that have been assessed through a set of criteria. 
So we've got things like um, DLA, Disability Living Allowance, you've got your PIP, your Personal Independence Payment, Armed Forces Independence Payment, Attendance Allowance, Constant Attendance Allowance, you've got your Scottish Disability Benefits, so your Child Disability Payments, your Adult Disability Payments, and your War Pension Mobility. Oh, I can't say it. War Pension Mobility Supplement. So if anyone in your household is in receipt of any of those benefits, and you were receiving it on the 25th of May, or if you've currently got a claim in and it's going to be backdated to before the 25th of May, keep a little eye on it, um, you should receive a £150 disability cost of living payment. Um, again, it's paid automatically, it will be paid into your bank account. I know there's been a huge delay with some people receiving this. The payments are coming through now. Um, and with any of the payments that I've mentioned, apart from the energy one, you need to go direct to your energy supplier for that one. You can report a missing payment. So I've put in a big red box there. Click this link. Click this link if you are eligible or you believe you're eligible for any of these payments and you haven't had it yet. OK, so yeah, uh, the winter fuel um, is just starting to be paid now. So that might be one just to keep a little eye on. But your council tax rebates, your um, cost of living payments and your um, £150 payments, you really just need to keep a little eye on where we're at with those. OK. So just building on what Ashley Jane's popped into, into the chat, and maybe some of the resources that Michael's going to mention. And it just builds really nicely on what Darren said. So the first thing that we have um, on our website to direct you to, it's a lot of information. It's all in one place. And then from that place, you can access different things that you want to um, have a little look at. So it's our living costs website. So support with living costs. This website will take you through. The link will take you directly through. So get a welfare benefits check. I really can't just express how many people we see who are not claiming everything that they're eligible for. Um, top up benefits, you know, and the key thing to remember is that when it comes to welfare benefits, there are different categories for different types of support. But the overall theme is that it's per household income. It's not down to individual income. It's about household income. And it's about the circumstances within that household. So who lives there, for example? Are there any children? Are there any um, people with long-term disabilities or health problems? A lot of people are not claiming their income top of benefits. So things like universal credit. Um, pension credit is another one. The disability benefits are really underclaimed, especially attendance allowance, which is a, a benefit for people who are um, over state retirement age at a new point of claim. And another thing that we see a lot of is people who um, are scared to get their benefits reassessed, which is a completely understandable um, predicament to find yourself in. But with some extra help and support and actually look at the eligibility criteria, it's always worth just checking, you know, especially with things like um, mobility if someone's struggling to get out and about. So we would always recommend seeking advice. I know I've spoken to a few of you um, in the past about how you can access that and the kind of things that you need to you need to consider. We've got a link to a free budgeting planning tool on there as well. I'm not quite sure which one it is. Maybe we've got Jane on this um, particular session, so we might be updating that and changing it. And it's also about prioritising your essentials, you know, to help um, if your budget's under pressure. Thinking about your outgoing, some really good tips there, you know, about thinking um, about am I paying the, the right energy provider? Am I at the right rate? Am I on the best package for my TV, internet, insurance, for example? And lastly, we've got a, a session, um, a section about debt. So if you're struggling to pay um, your, your debt on your energy providers or if you're missing payments or if you're falling behind, you know, about the different options that you can do there. And whenever you find yourself struggling to pay something, the advice is always ring them up, email them, chat to them, whoever it is, whatever it is, you know, and let them know. You know, a lot of the, the big companies, for example, energy providers have the vulnerable debt team and they are there to help and support you. Although it can be quite tricky to get through, you know, do persevere. 
you know it's really important that you start to think about how you can get back on track and there are a lot of organizations that provide free advice to allow you to do that so again you can click those links just through there the other lot of websites that we have um, and this is help with fuel costs so this goes into a lot of detail so we're just going to continue on that theme of support so there are further tailored support, um, such as the winter fuel payments, cold weather payments, the warm home discount scheme, energy support grants if um, you're in, in Wales or Scotland, for example. So there's the Welsh winter support scheme. Um, in Scotland, there's the child winter heating assistance payments. These are all starting to come in, as well as the section on top tips to help save costs on energy bills and becoming more energy savvy. The last share and learn session um, I did, I think it was just last week, we, we started to look a little bit about becoming more energy savvy and thinking about how we can reduce um, the energy we use and the energy we are using. Like that tip there about using a slow cooker, finding how much stuff you use. Um, I've included some top tips at the end of this presentation. If we've time, I'll go through a couple, but if not, just to give you a sneak preview. I hold my hands up here. Now, this is probably my, I am not very good and I am trying very hard to get better, but it's boiling the kettle. A simple thing, you know, how much water do you put in the kettle? You know, all the top tips say, take the cup, fill it up, put it in the kettle. I do that, but there doesn't seem to be enough water. And I, and I know that's not logical. So I always add a little bit more and then lo and behold, I've made the cup out and I've got this extra water left. So pop it in a flask, pop it in a hot water bottle, pop it somewhere, <laughs> but keep it hot. If you've got a decent flask, it'll stay hot for ages. OK, so the winter fuel payments um, and the cold weather payments. Uh, cold weather is if we have uh, prolonged periods of cold weather, they're automatically triggered if you're in receipt of um, a means tested benefit. But what I want to just draw our attention to for the next five or six minutes or so um, is the warm home discount scheme. So this, this is very controversial and Carers UK and a lot of other charities, we, we do listen, we are understanding that actually this is a big change and it isn't necessarily a change for the best. But what I would recommend is that do let your MP know, you know, let as many people as you can. So let your local councillors know, let your MPs know. Um, the louder we can shout about this, the more it will be heard. So. The warm home discount scheme, for those of you who were maybe familiar, was a scheme where each household and received an extra payment of £140 um, if you were in receipt of certain means tested benefits. So there are some big changes. So for the scheme for this year, which is just about to open, um, if you are in England and Wales, the good news is the number of suppliers participating in the scheme has increased. Yay! The amount of money you're going to get has also been increased from £140 to £150. Those who were in core group one, so those of you who were in receipt of pension credit, um, you don't need to do anything. You will automatically receive this payment of £150. You might get a letter just asking for confirmation to prove of your prove your entitlement, but you don't need to do anything. OK, that is going to stay the same if you're in England and Wales. If you are not in receipt of pension credit and you qualify through one of the other two ways of becoming eligible, so these were known as the broader group. Um, so these were people who were in receipt of either an automatically qualifying um, welfare benefit or they could show that they had low income. Um, you then um, apply directly to your supplier and if you were eligible under their scheme, then you received that payment. In England and Wales, that is no longer the case. OK, what will happen is that no one needs to apply. Instead, a new data matching system is used to assess eligibility and where eligible payments will be made automatically. The money is not paid to you. I just want to make that very clear. It's a one off discount that is put onto your electricity bill and the payments are being made between October. So they've started last month and they go all the way up until March next year. So, you know, it, it isn't here immediately if you are eligible. You may be able to ask for the discount to be put onto your gas bill instead. So if this would be the case, if your supplier provided you with both gas and electric, 
and you would need to contact your supplier to find that out. And it doesn't affect your eligibility to anything else, this particular one. But it isn't that straightforward. Okay. You can still qualify through on pay as you go meters. Um, and again, your electricity supplier can tell you how to get the discount. It's normally a code or a voucher. If you live in a park home, so if you live in a mobile home or a caravan, for example, applications are very different this year. You can apply directly to an organization called Charis and they can give you information about their particular scheme. OK, but for everyone else, if you're not in receipt of pension credit and you live in England and Wales, um, you need to be what's known as on a low income and have high energy costs. And so this is known as call group two. If you live in Scotland, you can qualify either if you get the guaranteed credit of pension credit um, or you're on a low income and meet your energy supplies criteria. OK, so you need to apply directly in Scotland to your energy supplier, the same as you always have. The warm home discount scheme is not available in Northern Ireland. If anyone here is in Northern Ireland, you need to find out about something called the affordable warm scheme. And what I've done is I've just included a link for that. But just to um, just to clarify, so I'm going to just focus on England and Wales for the moment. So if you get pension credit and you were paid pension credit, the guaranteed part of it, and you received a payment on the 21st of August or during that initial period, you or your partner's name is on the bill, you or your partner's name is on the electricity bill, okay? Then um, you will receive it automatically. You don't need to do anything. Um, it will be a straightforward payment. It may be that you receive a letter just asking you to double check, um, provide details of your, your pension credit, for example. Okay, if you don't get a letter and you think you're eligible and you don't receive a payment by the 31st of March, um, it's worth just getting in touch and just double checking. Now, if you're not in receipt of pension credit, but you were in receipt of one of these other benefits on the 21st of August, and so I've got those just down at the bottom there. So it's the usual suspects, so income support, income related ESA, income based JSA, uh, universal credit, housing benefit. If you were receiving child tax credit or working tax credit, but you had a, a income below a set threshold, um, you can still qualify if you got that benefit in the week of the 21st of August and your property has a high energy cost score based on its characteristics. So I'm going to come to high energy costs. And this is where I was saying you might want to talk to your MP, you might want to go to your councillor. Those of you who are familiar with the scheme know that previously carers allowance was a qualifying benefit. All of the disability benefits were qualifying benefits. They have been removed this year. OK, it is a huge change and it is something that I personally don't think and I know as an organisation don't think necessarily needed to have been made. And I think I can leave it at that because I'm sure the rest of you can pretty much guess what I'm thinking. OK, so high energy costs, not what you would think. It's not about how much energy you use. It's not about how much energy you spend. It's actually based on whether your property is likely to have high energy costs due to its property type and its energy performance certificate. So the valuation office holds this data. Um, it's the same agency that values properties for council tax, and they're looking at your floor area, your property age, and your property type. So if you're a low income household and you are considered to have high energy costs, and that information is given directly to the DWP, and the DWP pay the money to you, not your energy company you will receive that um, automatically. And this is where the confusion arises. You don't apply for it. You can't apply for it. If you're in receipt of a qualifying benefit and your property is assessed as being one of a high energy cost, that money will be paid to you. Okay, so if you're eligible, the scheme opens on the 14th of November. You'll receive a letter. Um, telling you about the discount. Most eligible households will receive this discount um, 
prior to the end of February 2023. Um, and if you're eligible, your electricity supplier will discount your bill by the 31st of March, but only after they've been told to do so um, from the Department of Working Pensions. So it's a little bit complicated. So in, if you're in Scotland, <laughs> apply as normal is what I'm going to say there. <laughs> if you meet the eligibility criteria um, and you were at that point, so back um, earlier on in the year, um, you do need to stay with your supplier until it's paid. So don't chop and change suppliers. Um, so it might be that actually you are eligible for it. It's not going to be paid until February. You are tied to that supplier. So you'll need to make an informed decision about whether it's more beneficial for you to move suppliers and lose the discount or stay and receive the discount, um, for example. With the, the scheme in Scotland, the number of discounts that energy suppliers can give is limited. Check with your supplier as soon as you can um, if you think you're eligible, when and how to apply. Um, check with them even if you were eligible for a discount last year um, and let them know. Um, it's one of these things, if you don't apply when the scheme is over, then I'm afraid that you miss out. And don't forget, for those of you in Northern Ireland, find out about the Affordable Warmth Scheme and how you can apply for that. Okay, so on that cheery note, what I think I'll do is I'll just um, cheer us up with a little, a little couple of tips there. Check your thermostat, so just building on what Darren has said there. Um, check it's not too high unless someone has a particular illness or condition that means they may require extra heat, of course. Okay, think about your layers. We all know about layers, but more layers are better than just one thick, chunky layer. Okay, think about the kettle. Every time you boil that kettle, think of me. Have you got any extra water? Could you pop it into a flask? Can you top up your hot water bottle? Heated throws are a big thing that's very popular at the moment. They're not just for nighttime, um, but there's a lot of talk about um, just being mindful about where you're heating. So are you heating um, rooms effectively? Or are you heating rooms efficiently? Um, but also remember that a cold house is not necessarily a good house, especially if you've got long term health conditions and disabilities, problems with your chest. Um, you don't want to be getting in a damp environment either. So really just look at how much is your your um, energy costing to use, um, you know, and just look at keeping your house at um, a, a general temperature. OK, so there's lots of different schools of thought about whether you should um, boost to heat or whether you should have constant heat. That's not something that I'm an expert on, but it is something maybe you would like to do a little bit of research. Close your curtains, tuck them behind the radiators wherever possible. I'm guilty of not doing that, but actually it's a pretty simple thing that could help save you money and keep you warm, as well as some very thick socks. I've got a lovely pair of knitted bed socks that my mum made me many years ago, and actually they're really cosy. I did laugh when she gave them to me, but you know, never mind. So on that note, I'm just going to pop it back over to you. And as usual, um, if you want to get in touch, there's telephone helpline, email, there's a forum there. Um, a lot of people are posting stuff in the forum. They come through to us and we're very happy to reply um, either directly to you and you can find us on all the usual channels. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>